All right, John chapter 6, verse 22. We've seen Jesus pour into the, the lives of these 12 rugged, ragtag ragamuffins. 12 men that uh, really, many of them should be enemies. We have Simon the Zealot, who... Uh, the zealots, if you're unaware, during the time of uh, the Roman rule over the, the, the nation of Israel, the zealots were looking forward to the Messiah coming and overthrowing the Roman Empire. So you have Simon the, the zealot, one of the twelve, and then you also have the tax collector. This tax collector who was seen as a traitor to the Jewish people. And here they are serving alongside each other under the banner of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is shaping these 12 men to change the world, to carry out his message. Now the meaning of the title Christian has become at best murky today. 76% of Americans still identify themselves as Christians. But what does that really mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? For many people, it means many different things. For some, it's simply a set of beliefs that they adopted from their parents, and their parents adopted them from their grandparents. It's a a list of rules. I go to church on Sunday or every other Sunday or at least Christmas and Easter, and that makes me a Christian. Or I have a few verses hanging in my house, and that makes me a Christian. It's my worldview. I vote Republican. So I'm a I'm a Christian. Dave, don't rush the stage. Where's he at? <laughs> Got to keep an eye out for him. Maybe it's just a club. I'm part of so and so church that makes me a a Christian. I have a Bible in my my desk drawer that makes me a Christian. I'm an American, so that makes me a Christian. Well, the word Christian first appears in Acts chapter eleven where we read that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The word Christian is a Greek word. The root word is Christos. It means anointed one. And that's followed by a Latin suffix that means adhering to. So literally, Christian means adhering to the anointed one or belonging to the anointed one. Or put simply, follower of Christ. But it's interesting because Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. There's another word that's used to describe Christians that is used much more often. And it's the term disciple. Disciple is used 300 times in the New Testament. But again, disciple is another word that has kind of lost its meaning. When we think of disciple, what do we think of? When we think of discipleship, what comes to mind? Discipleship courses, discipleship classes, discipleship podcasts, books on discipleship. We think of kind of a training course or a training class. But disciple in the New Testament simply means pupil or student but it's a very specific type of student. And if we're going to understand what a disciple is, we need to understand another term, and that's the term rabbi. Now, when you think of rabbi and disciple, I think you think of this ministry Jesus had with his disciples. When you think of discipleship in the context of Scripture, you are thinking of Jesus walking around Galilee and the surrounding region, training up the twelve. But we have to understand that discipleship did not start with Jesus. Now, Jesus came as a rabbi. He was much more than a rabbi. But understand, Jesus stepped in to humanity, into this world, as a rabbi. He could have come as a king, he could have come as a prince, he could have come as a world leader, he could have come as a wealthy man, an affluent man, but instead he came and stepped into this world as a teacher, as a rabbi, into a pre-existing 
system, if you will. So I just I want to spend a moment talking about that relationship between a rabbi and a rabbi's disciples because it's essential in understanding Jesus' precious call when he says, come and follow me. Jesus is called rabbi over 60 times in the New Testament. And again, as many of you know, that term means teacher. Some of your translations translate the word rabbi to teacher. But it's a very specific kind of teacher. See, in the first century, even bef- and it wasn't exclusive to Jewish culture, this rabbi-disciple relationship was relatively common. Some of the great Greek philosophers were rabbis, and they had their own set of disciples. But for the sake of this morning's teaching, let's look at discipleship under a rabbi in the context of Jewish cultures. Now, the Jews, they had three levels of education. The first level was kind of like your elementary school. It was open to both boys and girls, and it was called the house of the book. What book do you think they were referring to? The Torah. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And by the age of 12, you would have the Torah memorized. It's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? Some of us, the only verse we know is Jesus wept. And we can't even tell you where the (laughs) verse reference is. We know it's somewhere in maybe the Gospel of John, hopefully. But by the age of 12, you would have the Torah memorized. And all children, all Jewish kids, both male and female, would go to this house of the book. But after that, you were done. If you were a female, you'd be married off into a family. If you were a male, you would go and learn your father's trade. And you would apprentice under your father. Now, if you were the elite of this group, if you had a unique mind... If you were highly intelligent and highly motivated, there would be a very select number of star students who would move on to what is called the house of learning. Now that house of learning was for males only. And they would learn under a paid teacher. And they would memorize the Old Testament in its entirety. This was for the elite of the elite. And for most Jewish men, that was it. I mean, that in and of itself was an accomplishment. To be a part of the house of learning and to graduate the house of learning, you were looked on with a great deal of respect. But then there was a third level. And this was for, this was for the, the Greg Stevens of the world. This was for... The rare gems. And this was called discipleship. If you had proven yourself in the house of learning to again be a rare mind, then maybe, just maybe, a rabbi would come and invite you to an interview. And you would sit down with that rabbi, and that rabbi would school you on the Old Testament. And if he was pleased with you, if you impressed him, he would then give you this invitation. Come and follow me. And if by some miracle you made it this far, you had three goals as you learned under this rabbi. And again, this is rare error. This is an elite group of men. But if you made it this far and a rabbi said to you, come and follow me, you had three goals as you learned under that rabbi. One, to be with your rabbi. And when I say be with your rabbi, I mean literally be with them 24-7, never leaving their side. You would eat with them. You would sleep in the same house. You would go where they go. You would not leave their side. There was a a Jewish blessing that said, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi's feet. 
And that comes from the Mishnah, which is a collection of rabbinic thoughts from 200 BC to 280. There's a passage that reads, let thy house be a meeting house for the wise and powder thyself in the dust of their feet and drink their words with thirstiness. It's kind of the, uh, the illusion you women, you put on, some of you put on base makeup and you powder. Is that what base is? I don't know. Maybe it's a cream. But you got the powder and you powder yourself with, what is that stuff? I don't even hear what you're saying. But it was a similar way of thinking. You were so close to your rabbi they would lead the way, you would, you would follow so closely behind them that the dust, that their sandals would kick up, you'd be powdered in the dust of their feet. Now Paul alludes to this in Acts 22 when he's talking about how he is the Jew amongst Jews, a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. All the Pharisees were claiming all these credentials. And Paul says, if you want to go there, we can go there. Because I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the most renowned rabbis of the time, because Paul was the elite of the elite. Now, hopefully, this adds a little bit of color to Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus telling Martha, hey, relax, Mary's chosen the better thing. So, the first goal for a disciple learning under a rabbi was to be with their rabbi. Second goal, to become like your rabbi. As you learn from them, as you follow them, as you, you stuck to their side, you were expected to become like them, to think like them, to dress like them, to act like them, to talk like them. And then finally, you were to do what your rabbi did. That was the final goal. That was the, the pinnacle of discipleship. You were to be with your rabbi. You were to become like your rabbi. And finally, you were to do what your rabbi did. You were to become a rabbi yourself. You would take on your own disciples. And you would, you would multiply the teachings or the way of that rabbi. So why, why bring this all up? Why this little history lesson? Because we need to understand Jesus' invitation when he says, come and follow me. This idea of discipleship wouldn't be radical in Jesus' time. Jesus stepped into the world as this kind of teacher. But he didn't go to the synagogues. He didn't go to the elite of the, the elite to find his followers. He went out to the fishermen. The guys who at age 12, they said, ah, why don't you go back to your dad and learn how to fish? You don't quite have what it takes. And he went to the tax collector. And he went to the zealot. He went to those working class men who didn't have what it took and he said you you guys you guys follow me and they left everything and they followed him that invitation has not changed but the american church has lost sight of what it means when jesus says come and follow me he's not inviting people to come and take a passive interest in him He's not inviting people to simply believe in his historical existence. He is inviting people to be with him, to become like him, and to join him in the work that he is doing in this world. That is the invitation. The invitation isn't, hey, add me to your list of hobbies, or... Fit me into your schedule when you can. Or use me as some kind of genie when you get in trouble. No, his invitation is come be with me. Become like me and do what I do in this world. See, we often focus on conversion in church. 
and conversion is vitally important. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about that moment where we say, Jesus, I pledge my allegiance to you. I've been living for myself for so long. I've been my own God, but I acknowledge that you are exactly who you said you are, that you are the son of God, that you've come from heaven, you've taken my sin upon your shoulders, and you died for me, but three days later, you came out of that grave, and you defeated death, and you have promised that anyone who will believe on your name will be saved. And we... We said, yes, Lord, I believe. But that word believe means we've pledged our allegiance to him. That Jesus said, come and follow me. And we said, yes, I want to be with you. I want to be like you. And I want to do what you're doing in this world. See, it's not a simple invitation. Hey, come and follow me. Raise your hand and go to heaven. Just put that hand up. You'll go to heaven. No hell when there's so many people that would be completely satisfied with heaven, even if Jesus wasn't there. And that's not the invitation. Our invitation is to powder ourselves in the dust of our rabbi, to follow so closely to Jesus that we look like him, that the world sees us, but they don't see us. They see him. And these aren't my words, these are Jesus' words. In Mark 8, 34, he says, When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." Now, at this point in Jesus' ministry, as we've followed his life, as we've watched as he's called the twelve to him, as he's done the miraculous, he's raised the dead, he's given sight to the blind, he's fed the 5,000. When you start doing stuff like that, it draws a crowd. When you heal the sick, when you give sight to the blind, when you feed the hungry, people start showing up. And we are at a point in his ministry that wherever he goes, crowds are soon to follow. And we saw last week that he sent the disciples across the Sea of Galilee. And what should have been an hour trip took them all night long because they were fighting the wind. And Jesus was up on a mountainside praying with his father, communing with his father. And he saw the disciples struggling And so he walked out to them on the water. In one of the Gospels it says he almost walked right past them. And of course the disciples knew it was Jesus and said, thank goodness you're here. Come help. No, they said, no, it's a ghost. There's a a myth that the souls of the dead, those who had drowned, whether in an ocean or a sea, they haunted that body of water. So the disciples were buying into that mythology and they said, very literally, it's a poltergeist. And Jesus said, do not be afraid. He said, actually, be of good cheer. Be happy. It's me. And of course, Peter, being the star student, said, Lord, if that's you, call me out to you. And what did Jesus say? Come. And for a moment, Peter looked like Jesus. Jesus was walking on the water. Peter was walking on the water. And then Peter became distracted by the waves and the wind. He began to sink. And like a a dad training his child to swim, as the child goes under, he picked him up out of the water. And all of a sudden, they were on the shore. So that's where they are now, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Look at John 6, 22. 
on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except the one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? So in short, the crowds are looking for Jesus again. He had just fed 5,000 people with a handful of loaves and a couple fish. The next day comes and they're like, let's, let's find out where this guy's at. And they find him and they say, Rabbi, how did you get here? You didn't get in that boat that crossed over. How did you get here? Did you go the long way? Did you go around the sea? Now I want to point out that the crowds are going to interrupt. Jesus is about to give another long sermon, if you will, a teaching. He's about to speak. And let me tell you something. When the Savior of the world speaks, when the one in which all things are created speaks, we should probably just shut up. We should probably just listen. But we're not good at that, are we? The people are going to interrupt Jesus five times in this sermon. Instead of just listening. But these interruptions, and I'm not saying we're not supposed to commune with Jesus and talk to him and learn from him, but they're not simply interrupting Jesus. They're challenging him. They're resisting his message. They're not asking questions to better understand. They are challenging him. And that would be unheard of. See, they come up and they say, Rabbi, where have you been? But if they truly felt that Jesus was their teacher, they would be good listeners. That's a rare rare quality today. I think a lot of our prayer lives, myself included, is simply me talking at God. All right, God, this is what I need from you today. This is the changes I need you to make within me. This person's struggling with this. This person's struggling with that. Sound good? Okay, bye-bye. How often do we sit in silence before God and listen? It's not conducive to our culture today. We live in a culture of noise, distraction, constant But this is a principle of our walk with Jesus that cannot be neglected. Silence before God. Be still and know that I am God. How many of you are good at being still? We're just not trained for it in this day and age. But it's so, so necessary. Jesus is our example. Is he our rabbi? Is he our teacher? What do we see him often doing? John the Baptist was beheaded. He tried to seek solitude. The crowds found him. He fed the 5,000 and finally he got away to the side of the mountain and he communed with his father. He gave us an example. What is he doing the night that he is betrayed? He's praying. He brings his three disciples closest disciples with him and he says do what I do the enemy is close at hand pray and then he distanced himself from those three disciples and he found himself alone and what did those three disciples do the same thing we do when we try to get quiet before God all right God I'm going to spend time with you at 12 45 p.m a.m a.m right before I go to bed we're going to talk okay all right, God, speak to him. That's usually how it works for me. I'm talking about myself. Guys, do we want to become like Jesus? More time listening, less time talking. Less noise. Silence 
before God. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Do we know the voice of Jesus? The only way we know his voice is if we've been trained to hear it. Taking in his teachings, studying his word, being quiet and still before him as he teaches and trains us and mends us and shapes us into his image. Again, it's so easy to think, well, these disciples, they had a different level of relationship with Jesus. They were walking by his side day and night, night and day. They were uniquely able to learn his ways. Guess what? He lives in us. We're not walking alongside Jesus any longer. Our teacher lives within us. He has given us his spirit. Jesus said, it is better that I go away Because when I go away, I can send the helper, which is the spirit of Christ. That word advocate that we see in scripture, he will send the advocate. That's a really, uh, the Greek word there, the best we could come up with was advocate. But that Greek word more closely resembles the term one like me. Jesus sent the spirit of Christ, the spirit of himself, to come and live within us and train us up. So again, be with Jesus. We can't become like him if we're not spending time with him. I heard the other day, and it's so true, a lot of us think discipleship is about trying and not training, and it's the other way around. We think, man, if I just try harder to be more like Jesus, I will become more like Jesus. You will be left frustrated and empty and discouraged if you just dig in and try a little bit harder. It's not about trying, it's about training. It's about being a good student and sitting at the feet of our teacher, our rabbi. Rabbi, when did you come here? Verse 26. I love when people ask Jesus questions and he doesn't answer them. Instead, he cuts straight to their motives and their intentions. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but labor for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. I will give this to you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they interrupted. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Guys, we'll study the rest of this next week, but I want to just focus on those those verses in front of us, verse 26 through 29, because they really set the stage for what's to come next. So Jesus wastes no time exposing the motives of their hearts. He says, you're following me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. Now, think for a moment. Isn't that one and the same? The sign Wasn't the feeding of the 5,000, wasn't that a sign? Didn't Jesus say a wicked and perverse generation seeks a sign? He's saying you're following me not because of the signs, but because you ate and you were filled. Well, understand when Jesus talks about the signs, he's not saying you're here to see more parlor tricks in this context. See, in John 2, 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And then in John 20, 30, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The signs had a very specific purpose. They were to confirm Jesus' deity. 
to prove to the crowds that he was the son of God. He was not simply a teacher. He was a teacher, but he wasn't just a teacher. He wasn't simply a prophet. He wasn't John the Baptist reincarnated. He was God in the flesh. And only God in the flesh has power over life and death. That was the point of the signs. But for the crowd, the signs were the end. They weren't the means to the end. For them, that's all they wanted. All they wanted was that power. All they wanted was the ability to make something out of nothing. All they wanted was the free food. For the crowds, the meal was it. That was their primary motivation for seeking him out. Give us something to eat. Do that thing again. And they missed out on the reality that God in the flesh had come to earth. How is that possible? How could we want so, something so basic and so earthly and so worldly and so common? How could we want that and that become the main thing and we miss out on Something eternal. We do it every day. Jesus says, do not labor for the food which perishes. Or put another way, do not work for food. Now how many of you have to go to work every day to put food on the table? All of us. I've never seen someone on the side of the road with a sign that says, will not work for food. Have you guys seen that sign? Would not be very effective. We all work for food. Paul even wrote in his letter to the Thessalonians, we give you this one rule, that the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So why would Jesus say, do not work for food? Well, that word labor, it means to toil. Jesus is talking about the place in which we put material things in our lives. The place of preeminence that we put material things and our pursuit of those material things. Does that make sense? The more important something is to us, the harder we're going to work for it. The more we want something, the harder we're going to pursue it. And if something is of supreme importance to us, it will consume us. It's all we'll think about. Have you ever been in a place where you can buy a new car? What do you think about for weeks? Think about that car. You finally land on the model that you want, and what do you see all over the road? That car. Some of you are like, I've, hey, whatever car I can get, I'm happy with. If it runs, it has AC, awesome. It's not a bad place to be. But when something is important to us, it can consume us. You know, there was a survey recently of hospice professionals. And a hospice professional, if you don't know, they handle end-of-life care, quality-of-life care. They're a unique people. They're a special people. But they did an interview with many of them asking what people say at the end of their lives. What do people say? What lessons do they have for those of us that are willing to hear when they're at death's doorstep? And the number one thing men said in hospice was I wish I would have worked less. That's the number one thing men say. See, there's a difference between doing the best at our jobs and giving everything we have to our job. Pouring all that we have into a job. Now, those are two different things. They sound the same, but sometimes our job can have our soul. And not just our job. You can put our hobbies in that. You can throw really anything into that. Fitness, diets, cars, music, schooling, our kids. We are really good at taking good things and making them God things. 
And if you wonder, am I doing that? Let me give you a, a challenge here. Here's a test. Go to the people closest to you and say, what do you know me for? And when you think of me, what comes to mind? When you think of me, what do you think of? And if they immediately say CrossFit, that's what you're known for. That's what you've poured yourself into. Again, none of these things are bad things. But when it becomes all that we are, all that we pursue, then we have lost what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because you know what they said about the disciples? In Acts 4.13, when the crowd saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, they didn't go to the house of learning. They barely made it through the house of the book. When they saw they were unskilled, unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What did the crowd see when they saw the disciples? Hey, what do you know us for? Well, we know you for Jesus. We can tell you've been with Jesus. God, make me like that. We can and often do take good things and we put them in a place of preeminence and they become idols there. And whenever we have an idol, we are not following in the dust of our rabbi. We are following after that thing. And Jesus says that thing can't bear the weight of our greatest needs. Only he can. So don't exert all your effort and resources on something that is going to perish. Seek after me. Don't spend yourself on, don't pour yourself out on material things because they can't bear the weight of your need. There may be immediate gratification. All of us, we stress shop, right? We go on Amazon. I'm not really in need of anything, but let's see what Amazon has today. What are some of the suggested items? I don't need anything, but let's go to the mall and see. That's how my kids are. They get a little money from, for Christmas. They don't want anything, but they go out looking to spend their money. They don't even know what they want. They're looking for something to catch their eye. But all it is is a distraction. We shop for fun, not because we need something. But what happens after we buy something, after we eat something? 20 minutes later, we're hungry again, right? Some of you guys are on the keto diet. You're like, no, I can eat a piece of bacon in the morning and I'm not hungry until three days later. And that's great. <laughs> but for some of you carb eaters, you eat and then 20 minutes later, you're wondering, when can I eat again? But that's the point that Jesus is making. Do not labor for food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. I fed you so that I may point you to a greater truth. I gave you this meal so that I could point you to a far greater truth. I offer food that endures. I offer food that brings everlasting life. That's the same message that Jesus gave the woman at the well. He told the woman, whoever drinks from this well, they're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from me, they will never thirst again. Again, Jesus is talking about supreme satisfaction. No more longing for something more. No more searching for something better. Jesus is the end game. Now, if any of you, and this may be an analogy for like three of you, and for that I apologize, but there's this thing in hobby. Hobbyists will know this phrase, end game. Anybody heard that phrase before? You're into speakers or headphones or cars. You're always after that end game. And that end game is like the pinnacle of your pursuit. Okay, I got this headphone, I got this amp, I got this music source. It's the best of the best. It means I don't want anything better. I got this sound system with 12-inch woofers and a 6.5-inch midwoofer and a tweeter and, and high-end components, all fed by a 
$3,000 CD player. This is my end game. I don't want to upgrade. I've done these upgrades to my cars, my truck demo, and I am... That's really rude to say names, I think. (laughs) Sorry, bud. But I'm speaking to this because I know it. It doesn't matter what hobby you are in, there is never an end game because you're never satisfied. You always want to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. And Jesus is saying, stop. I am the end game. Everlasting life. Life eternal. And Jesus isn't talking about just the next life. He is talking about an abundant life here and now. He says, in me you will find supreme satisfaction. What does he say? My peace I will give to you. He also says, I say these things so that your joy may be made full. His peace, his joy But here's the key. As we follow him, it's easy to sit here and say, he promised me peace. He promised me joy. I don't have any of that. I'm a Christian. Why don't I have those things? My question is, are you following him? We can't wonder where our peace and our joy is when we spend all of our time scrolling through our phones and watching Netflix and shopping Amazon Prime and and playing Fortnite and whatever it may be. That was trying to be relevant with the younger folks. They're like, we don't play Fortnite anymore. We can't expect to have what Jesus wants to give us when we're not following him. Ultimate satisfaction is not found in our title of Christian. It's found in our apprenticeship to Jesus. Again, let me, let me put this stuff in context. None of those things are wrong in their proper place. I think it's good that we have things that we pour ourselves into, and I think we should do them well. But there's a line that we cross when they become everything. Do you understand what I'm saying? where life revolves around those things. And if someone talks about us, they say, oh yeah, Dan, the speaker guy, or so-and-so, the CrossFit person, that's what we're trying to avoid. We want them to say, oh, you're talking about Ron. Man, that guy loves Jesus. Which I've said before, because I know it's true. Jesus says that comes with God's seal of approval. Jesus is saying, follow me and you will not hunger. And that comes with God's stamp of approval because he said, as John the Baptist baptized me, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And what do the crowds do? They hear this and they interrupt. Instead of taking this in, and letting it change them, and allowing it to change their motivations and the way they view life. And instead of looking at Jesus and saying, yes, I'm going to follow you. These are the words that I've been looking for. They interrupt. And they say, fine, if you're not going to give us bread, teach us to make it ourselves. If you're not going to give us what we want, Teach us to do it ourselves. Give us the kingdom without the king. Give us the garden without the God. Isn't that what Adam and Eve said? Hey, we can be like God? Apart from God? All right, give us the apple. That's that's sin. That is the very core root of sin. Give us the blessing, give us the kingdom, give us the gifts without the gift giver. And that is exactly how you almost follow Jesus. They completely missed what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I am the prize. I am the bread of life. I am your sustenance. You will only find true satisfaction of me in me. And some will hear that and say, fine, wherever you go, I'm following. 
and it won't be perfect, and sometimes I'll fall down, and sometimes I'll lose track of you, but one thing I know, by your grace, when I return to you, you will be right there. But others will hear this and say, no thanks, more bread please. Teach us. Teach us to do the works of God. And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God. That you take me at your wor- my word. My prayer, and again, And I've said to many of you one-on-one, these messages are not for you first, they're for me first. I have an iPhone, I have kids, I have TV, I have Netflix, just canceled Disney Plus because there's nothing good on it. Good stuff is coming, so we'll get it back going when that comes. but we need to work together as a church family to encourage one another into silence and solitude. To hold one another accountable. Because we are not going to become like Jesus until we get alone with him. And that is going to be really hard apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and our obedience. Jesus said, blessed are those that hear my words and they do them. I need more time with Jesus. We all do. But we need to become comfortable with silence. And it takes a training, and it takes a transforming. And if you guys figure some things out that work for you, I want to hear it. If it's about setting your phone outside of your room before you go to bed, then do it. If it's waking up in the morning early, and not touching your phone, and just sitting before the Lord for 10, 15 minutes, then do it. If it's telling your kids, hey, until that clock says 7.00 a.m., don't leave your bedroom, then do it. Because this is far too important to miss. Are we Christians in name only, or are we men and women following in the dust of our rabbi, our savior, the son of God, Jesus Christ.